Hi there. Today we're going to continue reading Earth Dragon Wakes. Midnight, Wednesday, April 18th, 1906, Chinatown. Chin and Henry are supposed to sleep. Instead, they read by the light of the street lamps. They are still reading when Henry's parents come home. Mr. Travis has managed to lose yet another umbrella. Mrs. Travis gives Chin a piece of candy before he leaves the house. Don't let Mr. Travis know I gave this to you, she says with a wink, or he'll turn the house upside down to find my secret hoard. Ah Sing and Chin leave the Travis house. As they wait for the cable car, Chin eats Mrs. Travis's candy. He thinks about his own mother. Do you think mother misses us? He asks his father. Every day, the father says. Chin will have to spend most of his life here, like his father. Will Chin forget his mother after a while? Do you miss mother? He asks his father. Every day, his father says. It seems forever before the cable car comes. Chin can feel the book hidden under his shirt. He can't wait to get back to it. When he reads, he forgets his boredom. He forgets his loneliness. When the cable car finally arrives, sleepy Chinese climb down. Like Ah Sing and Chin, they work in the houses. They also live in them. But tonight, on their night off, they have gone to Chinatown. Ah Sing and Chin could have stayed with the Travises too. But Ah Sing insists they live in Chinatown. He doesn't want Chin to forget that he's Chinese. Their fellow houseboys fuss over Chin. He reminds them of the children they left behind in China. He usually welcomes attention. Tonight, though, he is impatient. He wants to read more of his new book. He climbs quickly onto the cable car. And <clears throat> remember that these families came to America to make more money for a better life. Um, and they didn't leave their children out of choice. They left them um, because they wanted to help their families and that way help their children. The crew greets him. They are friends with their Chinese passengers. They even wear silver pins of a dragon. The jewelry is a gift from the houseboys. The car lurches forward. The cable rattles and hums in its bed beneath the rails. Like a long metal snake, it wriggles along its track. The gripman hooks the cable car onto it. The cable car hitches a ride on the moving cable. Silvery tracks lead up and down hills. On the crests, that's the very top of a hill, Chin sees San Francisco spread out before them. Street lamps glitter like jewels. American houses perch shoulder to shoulder like pigeons. Beyond them rise the tall buildings of the business district. Some of them tower so high that people say they scrape the sky. They call them skyscrapers. Chin usually enjoys the views, but tonight he only wants the cable car to go faster. Chin and his father say goodbye to the cable car crew and get off in Chinatown. It is much bigger than his village in China. There are around 10,000 Chinese who live here, but not all of them speak the same dialect that he does. Though they come from China, he cannot always understand them. So dialects are different forms of a language that people can speak in a region, and sometimes they're very, very different from one another. So it is home, and yet not home. To Chin. Even the buildings are different. They are so much taller than the ones in his village. 
Some are three or even four stories tall. A few look like the Chinese ones Chin saw in Hong Kong before he got on the ship to come here. Most are American buildings. They look so plain compared to the ones at home. There are no tiled roofs or carved windows, but the Chinese have added signs and decorations to them. The American buildings look like they are wearing Chinese disguises. Though it is late, Chinatown is still very busy. Chinese shop in the stores. They eat in the restaurants. Americans dine with them. Some are ladies in evening dress and gentlemen in top hats. Some are in costume with roller skates draped over their chairs. They have been to the carnival. Chin can't wait to get back to their room, but his father drags him all over Chinatown on dull errands. He picks up a couple of Chinese newspapers. Then he buys a bag of apples for the Travises. Mrs. Travis hopes she can get Mr. Travis to eat them instead of cake. Chen has his doubts about that. Everywhere they go, Ah Sing bumps into friends. He always stops to chat. Chen follows his father impatiently. Finally, they return to their tenement. As they pass the little temple, their neighbor Ah Quan comes out. He dodges around a wagon and crosses the street to them. Chin groans silently. Ah Quan means another delay. Worse, he, will, he always stinks of blood from his work in his butcher shop. Many people avoid him because of that. He goes to the temple every night. He says he needs all the help he can get. Next to the priests, he prays more than anyone in Chinatown. Tonight, though, he's been asking heavens to keep the earth dragon quiet. The animals in his shop have been frightened. If I were a chicken and saw your knife, I'd be scared, too, Ah Sing says. But not this way. They're terrified, Ah Quan says. At home, animals know when there's going to be an earthquake. He scratches his head. I can't blame the earth dragon if he gets upset. There are all these people stomping on his ceiling. He begins to tiptoe. The earth dragon has shaken the city before, Ah Sing laughs. We're still holding on to his back, like fleas on a dog, Ah Quan grins nervously. But what if he gets really mad? Ah Sing does not take Ah Quan's fears seriously. He slaps his friend on the back. We've been through a lot of earthquakes here. If you're still alive, you pick up and go on. Chin thinks about Henry's dog, Sawyer. Silently, he asks the earth dragon to keep his temper. Together with Aquan, they climb the tenement stairs. When Chin had first seen the tenement, he had thought it was a hollow hill full of caves. It didn't seem very Chinese either. As they mount the steep steps, Chin hears the clacking of mahjong tiles. In that game, players match pieces, match pieces. Someone is playing the scales on a fiddle. Other people are arguing. Another person is crying, and still another is laughing. It is a small village in itself. Sometimes Chin wishes they didn't live on the top floor. It is very tiring to walk up three flights after a long day. In their room, his father takes an empty box from a neatly stacked column of boxes. You might as well put your book in here. I already have a box for my school books, Chin says. I mean the ones that Mr. Henry gives you, Ah Sing sighs. Embarrassed, Chin puts the book into the box. You knew? I can feel your library. Ah Sing rubs his back. I think I still have dents there. He holds up the mattress. <laughs> Quickly, Henry picks up the books underneath and places them inside the box. You can read them as long as you get good report cards, his father says. 
I will, Chin promises. He pulls out his book. May I read one chapter? His father sighs. It's better than having you sneak outside. Dad knows a lot. You know I've been reading on the stairs? Chin asks guiltily. His father smiles. I'm interested in everything you do. It just may not seem like it because I'm usually busy. Chin snuggles up in bed. Soon, he loses himself in Marshall Earp's adventures. His father is kind, and he works hard, but he is no hero. No one wants to read about peeling potatoes and washing dishes. 5, 11 a.m., that's in the morning, Wednesday, April 18, 1906, below San Francisco. Far below San Francisco, the Pacific Plate grinds against the North American Plate. It rubs harder than it ever has. The two plates slip and twist. Dirt and rock tumble, stir and tumble. In an instant, 375,000 square miles shake violently. All over the world, there are machines that measure earthquakes. Their needles start to wag crazily. In those days, scientists measured earthquakes in a different way. Today, we use the Richter scale. The great earthquake was 8.25 by modern standards. The surface rips open for almost 290 miles from Los Angeles in the south to Oregon in the north and east to Nevada, cliffs fall into the ocean, hills crumble into valleys, mountains crack, rivers twist, ancient trees topple and crash. But San Francisco is at the center of the destruction. It sits on the bullseye of a target. In its houses, almost 343,000 people lie sleeping or are just waking. It is as if more than 18 million sticks of dynamite explode beneath them. That is more force than the atom bomb that struck Hiroshima. This is the earthquake of 1906 when the earth shook so terribly. 5.12 a.m. So this is one minute later. Wednesday, April 18, 1906. Travis Household, Sacramento Street area. Sawyer has been restless the whole evening. He whimpers all the time. He keeps waking his master. Henry does not sleep well either. It is twilight just before dawn and Sawyer lets out a howl. Henry sits up and tries to calm his pet. Everything's all right, boy. Around him is the same boring room, the same bureau, the same bookcase, the same desk. Then he sees the gleam of his new roller skates. They are hanging on the back of a chair. Perhaps not everything is boring. He can hardly wait to go skating. Suddenly, Henry hears a low rumbling. Sounds like a train coming. His books bounce on the shelves as if they're alive. Henry has been through earthquakes before. He is not worried. The shaking stops for a moment. He takes a breath and the rumbling starts again. The bookcase tilts back and forth. The books fall, thud, thud, thud. Henry's heart, heavy oak bed hops with them. It skips like a grasshopper. He holds his dog tight. More books spill out of the bookcase. The chest of drawers dances a jig. The walls groan. The wooden floor ripples like the waves of an ocean. Windows rattle. Doors thump in their frames. The whole house shakes like Sawyer when he has an itch. Plates crash in the kitchen below. Picture, pictures and then plaster drop from the wall. Old boards show through the gaps. 
Henry coughs in the growing cloud of dust, and still the shaking goes on. His bed and all his furniture circle in a slow waltz around the room. Then the window shatters. The shade flies up with a flap. The other houses in the neighborhood jerk about. Immediately across the street, the Smith's house falls apart. Bricks rain on the ground. Dust rises and hides the street. From within the clouds, Henry hears screams. His father bangs at his door. Henry, Henry, are you all right? He calls from the hallway. Yes, how about you and mama? Henry asks. He stumbles out of bed. The floor shakes so much that he cannot stand. He crawls to the door. We're f fine, darling, his mother says. Henry tries to open his door, but it won't budge. The door is now crooked in the frame. It's jammed, he says. Don't worry, his father promises. I'll get you out. He hears another rumble. There is a crash above him. He dodges when a chunk of ceiling falls. Bricks shower down. They smash against the floor. Boards splinter and break. Five twelve a.m. This is at the same time, but it's in a different place. Wednesday, April eighteenth, nineteen o six. Chin and Ah Sing's tenement, Chinatown. Chin is pouring water from a pitcher into a bowl. He needs to wash up. Then they will catch a cable car to Henry's house to cook breakfast for the Travises. But suddenly, everything trembles. The bowl creeps across the table. Then even the table crawls away. Chin spills water everywhere. You can write your mother about your first earthquake, his father says unworriedly. The floor rolls under them like a wooden sea. The bowl slips over the edge and crashes. Boxes tumble from the stack. Their possessions scatter across the floor. Chin and his father drop to their knees. Ah Sing tries to sound brave. The earth dragon must be scratching, he laughs. Chin tries to be just as fearless. When the room stills, he tries to joke like his father. He must really have an itch. Before his father can answer, the trembling starts again. Chin waits for it to stop, but it goes on and on. The tenement creaks and groans like an old giant. Their bed and bureau prowl like hungry animals. Ah Sing crawls over. He puts his arms around Chin. Don't be scared, he says. Ah Sing's voice sounds funny because he is shaking with the room. Beneath them, unseen timbers crack like sticks. The next instant, one side of the room tilts upward. They slide helplessly with all the furniture towards the opposite wall. Chin feels like a doll. Their belongings crash and thump as they pile up. His father forces him under the table. The tenement is falling! His father shouts. Walls crack and crumble. Windows shatter. Broken glass sprays like little daggers. Chin's stomach feels funny when the room itself drops. They bounce against the floor as it stops with a jerk. For a moment, they lie there. Their neighbors scream from the middle level. Ah Sing and Chin's room is crushing them. Then the floor twitches. It plunges again. There are more screams. This time, it is the ground level that is smashed. Their floor gives one final thump and stops. Dazed, Chin peeks out from beneath the table. He sees cracks. They spread like a crazy spider web around all the walls. Spurts of powdery plaster puff out. The walls crumble like paper. The ceiling drops down on them. Wow, things are getting exciting. One thing that I noticed that I thought was really interesting is that as you read through the story, you hear a lot of words that you would relate to a dragon. 
One of them was hoard. So dragons traditionally have hoards of treasure. And, oh my. I just lost power for an instant. So I, I think I can continue though. They have hoards of treasure. Another was the description of um, a silver snake, the cable car, looking like a silver snake. Um, and as you read this, as you listen to the story, you may want to go back and listen again. Um, see if you can notice more words that you might use to describe a dragon. Okay. Oh, long tape today. See you later.